Speed birthday, Jadzia. Thank you. <laughs> How wonderful. Many, yeah. many, uh, whatever it is of the day. What do they say? Many something of the day. I can't remember. My, my brain is, is left. I left my brain somewhere else. <laughs> many happy returns. Ah, okay. That's Thank what you. I wanted. Where are you? Uh, in Germany. Uh, still. Oh, wonderful. I talked to you before, like a few weeks back. But... My, my, my memory is like a sieve. I'm that's, really sorry. that's all right. That's completely fine. <laughs> Mine is true. I, ha I don't know what I have told you and what I did. So I'm like, oh, that's okay. We'll both, not we'll both figure myself. it out together. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> so yeah. everything is pretty, everything's looking pretty okay in Germany right now. We have, I don't know how many cases we have, but definitely not as much as the US. <laughs> No, unfortunately. I wish we had your case. No, I don't wish we had your cases, but yeah. I, I, wish, <laughs> I wish we had less I cases. wish that too. <laughs> it's such a drag. And, you know, it's been kicked around like a game of soccer, this whole thing. It's really bizarre. So everybody's just, all the same people are just trying to ignore the craziness around us. It just makes them all look like children, you know. They, they all have us, they all seem like children. There was, in the news today, there was one senator from somewhere who got upset with one of, another senator and actually called her something I can't repeat. And this is what it's reduced to. People have turned into animals. And it's really oh, sad because we're supposed to be looking up to emulating these people and we're supposed to try and we want to grow up to be like them. Unfortunately, they're not proving to be very good role models at the moment. So we're, we're still trying to figure out how we can meet more people than just one or two. And we're trying to figure out whether or not we can what time we can get to the store and which is the least busy time we're still in it yeah. so you know pray for us <laughs> I, I do i really really hope that this will be resolved soon like, yeah, i hope so that the vaccine is on its way and everything i mean in germany it's it's better we can go I, to the store without any disturbances we just have to put our mask on and everything's fine yeah what things are you doing now that you couldn't do before that you're really enjoying doing cooking i somehow learned how to cook <laughs> I'm not sure That's how fantastic. I did it. With my family, I wasn't really allowed in the kitchen because my father has this like protective side over the kitchen. He's the one who's cooking. So I wasn't allowed to try learning cooking That's for some reason. Terrible. That's terrible. Yeah. But has he allowed you into the kitchen again? He has to. He unfortunately can't really do much right now. So whenever I'm visiting, I'm like, let me cook things, please. <laughs> Isn't that such a pleasure to be able to cook for your family? It's really lovely. Yeah. Yeah. So what, what sort of things do you like cooking? What's the, what are your newfound discoveries? I have tried some sauces for pasta because I'm, I'm trying to become vegan. So it's really difficult for me to try to figure out what I can put into certain dishes. Do you know that there's a holy base for all sauces? Well, no, there's a holy base for lots of sauces. Mm -hmm. And they always include... Carrot, celery, and onion. Okay, is, I have missed all these spaces. <laughs> no, this is it's a basic thing. So you always fry onions mm -hmm. so that they go like translucent, like t begin to look yeah. really tasty. I know. What and then mean. you you grate in some celery and some carrot. That will give you a basis for some flavor. You put some white wine in there and let the white wine get burned away, and mm -hmm. then start adding your ingredients. And if it's for pasta sauce, you start putting your can of tomatoes in there. The holy trinity are onions, carrots, and celery. Uh, this okay. is the base of nearly all French sauces. So always have carrots, onions, and celery in your, in, mm -hmm. in your fridge if, if you're excited about cooking, because you'll find that every big recipe kind of says, right, first. Okay. <laughs> you can always leave out the carrots for some things, uh, and you can, because a lot of pasta sauces do the carrots. And if you're making a moule marinier, for example, a, that delicious uh, mussel dish, it's just shallots and celery, lots and lots of celery for the Belgian, okay. the truly Belgian experience. And then lots of white wine and the mussels and you're running away. And so those are your basic big three. Which, which pasta sauces do you like, do you like making? About time you make cream sauces, which is completely different. I'm a bit wobbly with the vocabulary because somehow in school they thought like, hey, it's okay if we just teach you like 10 vocabulary words about food and then we go on to the analysis part. So I'm like, I don't really know how to say what I like about Oh, I've got a really good pizza dough recipe. And it makes the most delicious pizza. And, but that's a, that's a, I'll, I'll do that later. It just is failed. <laughs> At 
absolutely delicious. And you oh, need your yeah. tomato sauce for that. So you, you need to make a nice tomato sauce to make to put on the pizza and then you can start with big meats, whatever you want on a pizza, can't you? you? Obviously your father is not as young as he used to be. You're going over there and looking, checking up on them every week or so, is that right? Yeah. What was your papa before he before he retired. He is a photographer, not a successful one. We have his pictures hanging up on the wall next to mine, obviously, but he hasn't been able to do this for a few yeah. years. I can't really say what he did before <laughs> because he didn't really do anything. My brother's a photographer and then I meet lots of actors. They measure themselves by how famous they are. And that's <laughs> such a bad way of measuring how successful you are. Because mm. to be working at all for 20 years or 10 years as an actor is successful. And the same goes for photography and poets. Because I mean, you can imagine poets, they're never mm. going to make it. It's just never going to happen. <laughs> yeah. But that doesn't mean they're not successful. So we've got to find a new rubric for discussing how successful artists mm. are. Do you write or, or draw? Do you have any interest in those sort of things? I, I do both. I write a bit for myself mainly, and I draw also for myself, but I, I really, really like drawing. Good. And a few of the chat already saw my drawing on, on Twitter, which I did after last time I spoke to you. Yeah. Which was a drawing of Julian. Oh, <laughs> um, yes, yes. I think I think I might. Did you show Did you show me? Someone told me not to show you. I probably asked you what, what you were studying and what you were trying to achieve. Yeah. I'm uh, still studying Celtic languages. I remember you remember? You okay. That's pretty weird. And yeah. did, did we talk about Queen Bodicea? No. <laughs> I think she is a fantastic person to look into. I don't know whether that, if there's any angle, any reason you can, but I suspect she spoke maybe Anglo-Saxon, but Celtic would have been very much one of the languages flying around in her world. I think she's wonderful. She's a woman who basically defeated the Romans, beat them back all the way to London from the west of England. Yeah, I think I remember uh, something like that, but I'm not yeah. quite sure. <laughs> She was a queen of a tribe. It was much more a tribal situation back in those days. And so she, she, did, she wasn't queen of England, but she had such charisma and such incredible power and determination that she unified all the Brits in the south uh, of, of England to raise such a, a big army that she defeated the Romans and created enormous panic. So she's kind of a hero of mine. After the Nanking Rebellion in China, it emerged there was one woman who had a very similar story and she too as a 16 year old got together a huge army and found him and killed him eventually. I'm just ripping on, um, on incredibly powerful women just, just only because Bodice was, is, was a real inspiration to me for many years and to the point where I wanted to make all kinds of movies and TV shows. I wrote a script, you know, <laughs> I did everything I could to, to get excited about it. But because you're doing Celtic, I just thought that it's a bit tangential, but it's, you're actually in the right zone for understanding more about her than we do, but certainly I do. What are you going to do with Celtic language? How are you going to contribute? It's difficult to contribute in Celtic studies because there are only two places in Germany where you can study it at all. And our department is dying. We have like 30 students in total. Right. At least yeah. that's what it feels like. We actually have rooms that are not even in the department they are supposed to be in, but there's a paper in the door saying this is the Celtic Studies room. Oh. And, uh, yeah, that's um, kind of messed up. <laughs> that's a bummer. Yeah, absolutely. So I, uh, how many years have you got left? In theory, I should study for two, uh, three years. I'm in my second one, but due to Corona and everything, I will yeah. have to stretch my studies for about a year, at least, yeah. maybe even Repeat longer. Yeah. Um, I mean, I enjoy the subjects. I enjoy, uh, I love my teachers. They're absolutely amazing and they do their very best to <laughs> kind of keep it interesting. Yeah, and do you so. have options to pick up minors, other subjects, smaller subjects? It's not part of the degree, but it just would interest you and, and, and kind of bolster the Celtic studies? I'm not quite sure, actually. I know we don't have that many uh, subjects that really go well with Celtic studies, except yeah. for maybe English studies, which is my major. Well, anthropology. I can do any course I want. I can like learn every language that they teach in Celtic studies to kind yeah. of do more courses. Social anthropology is a course that would really, it would, might join some pieces together because yeah. you're dealing with some very ancient language and to understand the hierarchy of the societies that 
mm. were speaking Celtic, both in Ireland and Scotland and, and in Wales. That would be kind of really interesting. I studied anthropology at university. This is 40 years ago, so, or whatever it was, 35 years ago. For me, it was a very nascent, early, they hadn't got, they didn't know really what it was. <laughs> they didn't really know what we were studying back then. But now it's much more evolved and they've got a much better sense of how to teach kids what the, the subject's about. And the social aspect of anthropology, this physical anthropology, which is basically kind of archaeology, putting bones and finding, and finding out what kind of sources and plates and cups people had in their camps mm. and, and joining <laughs> the dots, figuring out what sort of lives they may have led, which is fascinating if you're more sort of clinical-based approach. Mm. But the social anthropology is really about hierarchies and maternal systems and paternal patriarchal systems and, and all of that stuff. Because I can think of a lot of reasons why people would, might need your expertise. For example, many films using the language, the Celtic language, which seem to be more and more every year, or TV shows, they would like an expert who would understand how to enunciate Celtic words but also understand the framework in which the, the words are used. I can't remember, there's someone here's a linguist, a pineapple person is a linguist, because <laughs> she's got pineapples in her garden. But she will tell you that, talk about the fact that words in context are, are really important. And most actors get words out of context when they're learning different languages. And I, yeah, yeah. I'm quite good at it because I do Arabic a lot mm. or Aramaic or various languages. And I'm always getting it out, out of context. And I need someone to help me. I, I know what the words are. I can, you know, I can see the words on the page and I, I can understand what they sound like, but I don't know whether I'm being angry or sad when I'm saying them. <laughs> okay. I'm speaking a language I don't understand. So you can help with those things. Well, listen, yes, it's I lovely, could. To, talk to, you. <laughs> lovely yeah, to talk to you again. And thank you for doing this. I really enjoyed the um, play. Thank you for yeah, doing this. It was it's great. It was a good one. They, Matt and Craig did a really good job on it. Happy birthday. Happy birthday! Okay, next we're going to Jana. Hello! Hi, it's nice to meet you. What a pleasure to meet you too. Where are you? You look like you're in a, in a bay window somewhere. You're oh yes, a... I am actually in my uh, dining room. It's just got these huge windows behind it for some reason. It's kind of fun. I've watched like a bug lay some eggs there and then I watched them hatch, which was <laughs> super fun. Oh, I see everyone is commenting on my sword in the chat. Oh, there's a sword, yeah. I just yes, there is. My goodness, um, it's Excalibur-esque. Kind of, yes. I don't have a name for her. I just call her my lady. It is <laughs> not a real sword. I uh, practice Hemo, which is historical European martial arts. So medieval oh, wow. sword fighting, basically. There's a club at my college. I'm really curious how you do that because... They all wore lots of armor. So what we do is we look at old documents that sort of texts that have how-to manuals on how to wield swords. And then we try to sort of, you know, revive those practices. But I bet that's really, really good fun. It is. We don't have like the funds to have full armor and metal swords. So this is a sort of, I think it's a plastic. It just bruises you if you get hit, which I have gotten before, but it's really fun and it's, it's pretty harmless. I think it's that's actually really ones. smart not to have a metal sword, to be honest with you. No offense, yeah. you know, you're very good at it. I try. But you're going to bump into someone who isn't good at it at some point, And then that's when you get hurt. Yeah. I... <laughs> That's amazing. Do you go to the woods or in a field, oh, a gymnasium? It's really funny. The school I go to has this big room that they use for balls and gatherings and stuff that has just a tile floor and some really high ceilings. And we just go, well, we learn the forms and then, then we hit each other a bunch with the swords in there. <laughs> And does everyone have a plastic sword? We have club swords, but I went and got my own after like about a year. I think it's, very, year. it's a very pretty sword. Thank you, what I, I decorated the, the, it. the symbols on it? I've written things that are important to me on it. So I've got in um, a line from Beowulf, which is, I guess in Old English, but it's been translated into Futhork here, because why not? And then in Ancient Greek, the first line of the Iliad, and the picture is actually my family crest that I painted, which wow. was fun. Yes, I'm lucky enough to get to know what my family crest is. Where are you? Where are you living? Virginia, right near DC, actually. But Virginians don't have family crests. No, but their ancestors do. And I happen to be descended from the black sheep of my family who got kicked out of Switzerland. 
for having a whole affair and he just happened to bring a family tree and a crest along with him. That's so. pretty impressive, I have to say. I love the fact that you picked Beowulf and you picked the Iliad. That's pretty yep. erudite uh, choices. It's not like, you know, I don't know what people have tattoos in Chinese or Arabic on there. <laughs> it's pretty yeah, great. And so you are still at school. You, you said you're William and uh, you said you're still William and Mary, which is yes. two, they're king and queen of England, William and Mary. So William and Mary was the uh, first college founded in America, technically before its founding. So it was named after them. It's pretty old. Um, I am a rising junior there. I'm one of two medieval and Renaissance studies students at the whole school. That's pretty wild. Yeah, that's a, that's a really humming classroom when, when you guys are together. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I didn't know the other one existed until a few months ago. <laughs> Your professor's always going, hey, settle down, guys. Come on, calm down. <laughs> Let's, let's stop talking. I can't get a word in edgewise here. Yep, it's just... <laughs> So what is, walk us through, walk us through what you're learning. So medieval and Renaissance studies is, well, in general terms, it's like a study of the Middle Ages and of the Renaissance, but though more so right now, it's been focusing on the Middle Ages. So recently I just finished a class on the history of all of medieval Europe, which is pretty long. Uh, Huge. So it's, um Yes. Before that, when I first came to William and Mary, I took a class on the Crusades. It was absolutely wow. fascinating. It. I loved yeah. it. Well, you can teach us something about it because it's people. Don't, it's very difficult. People can't remember which crusade is which, and they, they always know there's popes involved. <laughs> kind of upset popes, envious popes. What's your general impression of the Crusades? Let's What's see. your takeaway? My takeaway is that they're a lot more complex than people think they were, but yeah. they're also, I guess they're a reflection of a lot of medieval beliefs, but I sort of think the most interesting parts of the Crusades to me are not the moments of warfare, but more the moments of like cultural meeting and cohesion. The Crusaders came down to the Middle East to go get Jerusalem and they came back with courtly love and a a whole bunch of loan words that are still in the English language today. Like I know saffron is one. Are you taught or do you disagree? Is it a myth that Saladin was basically was the first chivalrous person invented chivalry? I haven't heard that exact perspective, but I don't think that's exactly a myth because Saladin, I do know, um, he became a folk hero in medieval Europe. Like they loved him. He was known, at least in part, for what like a great guy he was, which I think is really interesting because yeah. you, you wouldn't expect that, but there's stories. I know there's a folktale called Hugh of Tabari, I think, which is just about a knight talking to Sal Saladin. Yeah. And my favorite um, Chaucerian tale is the Knight's Tale. And I know there are a lot of fun ones, like the Miller's Tale and stuff. Gosh, some of the language. But the Knight's Tale really inspired me as a kid because I just wanted to be that very perfect, gentle knight. You know, and that was what seemed, and, and I completely understood the nature of being so in love with someone that you would do anything to win the, their pity. And that was the whole chivalry code, of course. And that interested me because when I found out that Saladin was the inspiration for chivalry, which got imported to France and to Europe and then became the basis of a whole method of behavior. Fascinating stuff. I have opinions about the Dark Ages. Good, I'd like to hear them. Yes, so they are considered sort of, I guess, the dark part of the Middle Ages, but there was quite a bit going on and all sorts of cool art that was being made and interesting theological discussion. The reason why they're called the Dark Ages is because later humanist Renaissance scholars wanted to think about how they had improved from the Middle Ages, which was this time they thought as overly saturated with Christianity and overly zealous, I suppose. So they sort of labeled it the Dark Ages, and we've considered them the Dark Ages ever since. But they yeah, were also- I mean, they're very Eurocentric. Time, yeah, because obviously the Arab world was being really interesting and the it Chinese were being yep. really interesting. Yeah, every, evolution was galloping ahead uh, mm -hmm. all over the rest of the world. It yeah. was just Europe, which was uh, uh, a bit like the Egyptian civilization, which for sort of thousands of years didn't evolve. 
<laughs> what was that about? They just didn't evolve. Yeah, they, they love staying the same, I guess. <laughs> and their art pieces. Yeah, their art particularly. I did a TV show once called Tut. I played the bad guy. But one of the things we did is just immerse ourselves, because you were trying to do some sort of research, in Egyptian art, because I was a priest and this is where all the artwork, you know, we were the guys looking after all the artwork. And I looked at art from, for over a 2000 year period and it did not evolve. It was really good to start with. It was pretty amazing. You know, the triangular skirts and everybody's like this. But you'd think someone would go, well, I'm we seeing something else here. Over 2000 years. Okay, I get it, over 200. But those guys refused to evolve. And there must have been a reason for that because they probably were so self-satisfied that they didn't think any, there was any point. So they got snuffed out pretty easily when the time came. So that's fascinating. What are you going to do with all this? I've noticed that I really love talking a lot about the Middle Ages. Like, if you get me started, I will not shut up. So I figure the best course of career for me is probably just to become a professor so I can talk about the Middle Ages and everyone is forced to listen to me. That's great. I mean, I could listen to you. I I'm very Thank happy you. to hear about all this stuff. This is something I know very little about. Where would we go to find out more about what you, what you do? Um, there's some YouTube channels I know, but I'm not very familiar with them. There's also many of the books have been translated now. I know some of the masters for Longsword, which is what I have there, are Meyer, and I think there's Lichtenauer. There, we, we mostly use German sword fighting because I think that's what stuck around the most and that's what's written about. Come back and we'll try and talk again at some point. I did Sounds learn a good. bit about German sword fighting because mm -hmm. we had at school to learn about all kinds of fighting because for stage work you have to fight. Mm -hmm. But listen, it's been it's really lovely talking to you and thank you for introducing us to your dining room and your great sword. I look forward to hearing more about the Renaissance and Middle Ages. <laughs> nice thank to you. see you. <laughs> it was nice to meet you. Good to meet you, Austin. Where in the world are you? Uh, I'm in Toronto. Oh, cool. I'm looking at behind you. There's a, is that the alphabet on the wall? It was my son's uh, work last semester. Or term. That's really cool. He did that? He did every letter? He and my wife drew it together and then they, and then he colored it. That is fantastic. It's, uh, he must be very tall because that's about six <laughs> feet off the door. <laughs> well, we put we we hung them up uh, with the step stool. Where he could never see them again, <laughs> <laughs> or more like where he can't tear them down. <laughs> That's really cool. How's the summer panning out for you guys? Well, it's it's been strange, as you can imagine. We're all just sequestered inside. So the other half of my family is, is German, so they went back to Germany. I'm not German though, so I'm still here in Toronto. So in Germany, they have a little bit more they can do. But Toronto's still pretty locky downy. Still pretty locky downy. I don't think we can even visit you guys from America. The border is is um, explicitly closed unless you you say at the border that you're driving to Alaska, then they let you in. Oh really? That's the loophole. Yes, yes. Even that's that is a loophole. Even if you come in at Toronto? Theoretically, anywhere, I think. It, every, in every couple of weeks in the news, there's uh, some Americans getting arrested for not socially distancing and not actually going to Alaska. So it's, 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 it's a rare occurrence. You need to export their ridiculous behavior. <laughs> their <laughs> ridiculous. Like, it seems odd to go to Canada to go and spread the virus there, just in case the Canadians are catching up with the Americans. <laughs> Why don't, if you're going to go to Canada, at least have the respect to socially distance and put a mask on. It's just plain <laughs> rude. I, it's, it's not even funny, really. So what, what are you not doing or doing at the moment that you would normally be doing or that you're, you're just carrying on with your normal life? I'm a professor at university, so normally I would be meeting with my researchers and students, uh, which I can't do. But in terms of good things, I've spent a lot more time reading books. <laughs> and in addition, I've been going vegetarian for the summer in an attempt to, you know, become a little more healthy. Wow, that's fantastic. What, how, how are you dealing with that? What are you, what are you finding that's interesting? What can you do that they go, oh, that's pretty tasty. I, I'm not missing meat today. Well, I really like tofu, so just, just oh, well, that's been like working tofu. pretty well. Yeah. Have you Sorry. found like eight ways to cook tofu? Well, you know, I, I think the other thing that I've really been enjoying this summer is normally when my family's here, I do all the cooking. But now that they're in Germany, I don't have to cook anything <laughs> special. <laughs> So uh, I just will have like super easy meals where I'm like, oh, I'll put on some rice, throw some tofu and tomatoes together. And that's a meal for the day. Whereas before I'd cook like that's three dishes. Sure. Are your whole family going vegetarian this summer? 
we've trained the boys to like tofu, so but we still eat meat. It's what and what what are you a professor of? Do you mind me asking? I teach architecture, and specifically within the discipline of architecture, I, I teach. I guess you call it building science or building performance. I do like energy modeling, uh, yeah, daylight absolutely. simulation. Are you impressed by the, the work going on in the Emirates to build a city that is completely carbon neutral, environmentally friendly, all that kind of stuff? <laughs> I do know the one you mean. I'm horrible with with, Me too. Uh, with names, but uh, that, that city is is particularly, in a way, it's it's not very impressive because no hardly anyone lives there. <laughs> and it's like in the middle of the desert and everyone drives their cars in from Abu Dhabi, I think, and, yeah. and parks and then walks in. So it's a little strange. Who are your favorite architects? Or maybe that's a better, better question. Is who, who are the notable architects for you? There's this one very famous architect who, whenever I travel somewhere where he has a work of architecture, I always try to visit. Le Corbusier. I think he designed Paris. He lived in Paris. Well, at some point he lived in Paris. He was from Switzerland originally. But he, he had some strange dealings towards the end of his life where he became obsessed with this American architect who also moved to France, Eileen Gray. And after she kicked him out of her house, he bought a piece of land next door and built a small shack there and lived there until he, he had a heart attack and died. But his architecture is very interesting. Forgive me if I'm, tell me if I'm wrong, but he, all those triangular buildings and all the, and that whole grid system in Paris is his design, isn't it? Uh, no, that's not from him. He had a plan to actually demolish large portions of Paris and replace it with like giant skyscrapers in a park, which was never realized, obviously. Who I'm talking about that I'm now confusing yeah, with you know. that uh, that work is from the as far as I recall from my education in back when I was just training for architecture is the work of the Napoleonic era and there was a there was a particular guy who was in charge of basically <laughs> planning the city uh, Osman yeah. Who basically designed the whole of Paris, and that's who I've completely yeah. conflated with Corbusier, which is totally nonsense. I'm, I'm, I don't know much about architecture, so I'm, I'm asking these questions genuinely. Yeah, uh, Corbusier. I don't know if there's a single work I could point to that like everyone would know, but he built a lot of buildings that were kind of raised up from the ground on basically columns, and that had these very modern open layouts. Pompidou Center is more, even more modern. That was. That's Richard Rogers and Renzo Piano. They're both still alive and practicing. I think there's a lot of similarity. Like you can clearly, clearly tell where they kind of derive from him. Le Corbusier was more 1920s. I think his biggest, like the biggest remains from Le Corbusier is that he was very into harnessing like natural environmental forces to make architecture comfortable, like natural ventilation, daylight, having a well-designed shading systems. Uh, and he had like a very strong aesthetic sensibility, like removing ornaments, making large open pieces of glass, view windows out to the environment. Those are, for current architecture students, I think are still very, or in arch practicing architects are still very important ideas. They certainly are. I mean, I, I watch sometimes watch shows in England, we have there are a lot of architecture shows, especially the Germans and the, the Scandinavians, uh, all, actually all that part of Europe, just not Britain. They are obsessed with building things that you know, you can't tell her there. And they have natural light coming in from the ceiling and a lot of it's underground and all kinds of really cool stuff that you would never know. You'd love to have a house like that, but there's just no way I'm ever going to be able to afford it. <laughs> it's, ex it's expensive building your own house. So your wife and, and your kid, they're still here or has your wife gone to Germany? They're in Germany. She's German and they're all half they have dual right. citizenship, essentially. Is it your son or your daughter? Or uh, your my, son, my son. He is learning German. So my, my wife is a little crazy. She speaks four languages and he's learning th three. <laughs> so he's learning German and Chinese and English. Wow. It seems pretty daunting to me to learn Chinese, but I would love to know. I've got a friend who's got a German father and a French mother. They sent him to school in an English speaking school. So he's trilingual right from the get go. It's fantastic to listen to. I'm really impressed by people who speak more than one language because I can't. And I'm just, I think I'm such a dimwit. Uh, yeah, I'm, I'm the same. It's so humiliating.
like, what is that? <laughs> I got a glimpse of the idea that you've been reading gives you pleasure right now. Is there a TV series or, or movies or documentary that you particularly like? At a distance, my wife and I have been rewatching Voyager, actually, oh, uh, cool. just because I think we can't escape sci-fi somehow. That's been highly enjoyable. I'm still, I think, too close to Star Trek to watch the Star Treks. And we're watching Mandalorian right now, my wife and I. Pretty good. I'm always looking for a bit more depth in the characters, but it seems like very E.T.E you know, go home, but it's the little, whatever he's called with the flappy ears. Listen, it's been lovely talking to you. Oh, thank you so much. And I've, I've really been enjoying Alone Together. Oh, good. Thank you. Hi. Hi, Amy. <laughs> How are you doing? I'm good, and you? Very good indeed. You are in a completely anonymous space in your house. Just really <laughs> cool. No diplomas, yeah. girls, no drawings. Where, where are you? I'm from Cape Town, South Africa. Oh my goodness, Cape Town. Fantastic. It's uh, one of the most beautiful cities. I just loved Cape Town. I shot a movie there and I nearly shot us another TV show that I couldn't get there, which I was really looking forward to because I would have spent a lot of time there in a house. <laughs> but it's what a great city. That's really fantastic. Are the penguins still there? Yeah, <laughs> as far as I know, yeah. <laughs> yeah. I think so. <laughs> one of the weirdest things the penguins in Africa. What is going yep. on here? <laughs> Of course, most of the plants we have in our gardens in Europe and North America, well, not most, but a great many of them originated in South Africa. So what are you doing? What are you up to? I'm still studying, but I'm at I'm on back at the moment. So I've been training and reading and drawing and just trying to keep myself busy. <laughs> How fantastic. And what sort of things are you reading? Well, at the moment, I'm reading a Star Trek book, but I can't remember the title. No, no, um, it's fine. I never remember the yeah. titles. <laughs> Have a look at the, and, the book before uh, I open it. Um, it's on my tablet, so... Oh, yeah. okay. I just pick up books and start reading. Like, if you had to tell me what is on the front, <laughs> like, I don't know. It's like watching movies. <laughs> like who wrote them? And what do you train at? Well, I actually I play soccer. So oh. um, I'm trying to keep myself fit. Yeah, it just it's kind of been a bit difficult to do that because of lockdown and all of that. So I've got to train at home yeah. and just figure out like what I'm going to do and whatnot. Where do you play? What position? Oh, I'm a left back. Oh, wow. Rare. Yeah. Are you left footed? No, I'm not. <laughs> I'm Ooh, actually so right footed. So. You're like a kind of, in, you're, you could be an inverted winger in the. You, you yeah, yeah. I basically play like a wing back. I've, uh, I went up when I was last in South Africa, which is after the World Cup, which mm -hmm. is phenomenal. I noticed that all the stadiums that were built for that thing were empty and the car parks were full of trees and plants again. And, you know, yeah. is it still like that? They just forgot about those stadiums because they were such a Yeah, waste. basically. I mean, even when they have soccer matches, the stadiums are relatively empty because people wow. just don't watch soccer for some reason. But it's a very common sport. Soccer is such a good sport to watch. <laughs> In America, of course, the women's team is way more popular than the men's team. So it's like, it's all about women's soccer here. What team do you support? A South African team or do you have an international um, team? No, I, actually, I don't support any team. I don't really watch soccer on TV, to be honest. I don't watch soccer on TV. Yeah. Oh, good. <laughs> I prefer going to live matches. Yeah, fair enough. But that's really cool. How long have you been playing soccer? I think this year would have been my ninth year. You must be really good at it. I guess so. <laughs> yeah. What's the organization like there? What's the structure like in South Africa for soccer? Pretty backwards? I mean, yeah, in a way, there's a lot of mixed feelings about it because it's kind of corrupt, but there is still process. I mean, there's still like, there's still stuff happening and uh, yeah. women's football is getting more support, but it's still not where it should be. Can women earn money playing soccer in South Africa? Can you make not a, a lot. living? No, he can't. Okay, so that is really like 20 years behind everywhere <laughs> yeah. else. It's tough because they love their cricket and they love their rugby. And of that's course. that's <laughs> pretty much it. We've got to change things up. I love cricket as well, but we've got to change things up. Are you going to be a professional? Are you a professional, going to be a professional soccer player? I mean... I am considering that, but so I'm pl I play soccer and I study at the moment. Right. The we'll fact see that how that goes. Even, by the way, is high praise. <laughs> then we're probably okay. Playing. And how do you get involved with City Social Club? How did you wind up with this group of misfits? Um, <laughs> um, I think I found it on Tumblr. I think someone posted it on Tumblr or I saw it on YouTube or something like that. I don't know. <laughs> and you were like, hey, I might check it out. See what's going on yeah. there. Yeah, that is basically <laughs> what I did. <laughs> Did you ever watch Star Trek or anything like that? Because that's what most oh, of the Oh, yeah. 
Oh, yeah, you did? No, you're okay. Star Trek fan. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think I've probably watched every single Star Trek movie. I think I've watched all the series besides Picard. So, right. Uh, yeah. Yeah, I haven't seen Picard yet. What do your family do? Well, my brother is still at school. Do you mean like in general or just during this period? Take, take a pick. What, are you all living oh, together? Oh, okay. Yeah, my parents are at home. They're working from home. And yeah, my brother, he goes to school. But he doesn't go to school every day, though, which is kind of weird. So he only goes to school certain days. If I'm not mistaken, South Africa relaxed and then are now unrelaxing again. Because yeah. It took off. It, it took <laughs> yeah. Off. So one of the rules that changed is that we can't purchase any alcohol beverages and we can't purchase any cigarettes and people are really upset about that because like that's how, how the lockdown started then that changed and then implemented that again so people are very upset about that and they started to loot um, liquor stores it does seem like an odd yeah. thing to ban i'm sure they have very good scientific reason for it apart from health yeah. reasons. but it seems odd to to do that during this particular time because it's it's sort of a quite a crutch <laughs> to deal with yeah them. yeah those, those are my thoughts too but yeah I mean, people are gonna get yeah. Yeah. Pretty upset if you start to <laughs> yep. away. Goodness, like, and no dogs and no cats and you can't see your grandpa. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you I mean you might want to be a, a professional soccer player, that's in the balance. I completely understand. What would you do instead? What, what are you learning to do? Well, I'm triple majoring in English literature, film and media, and media and writing. So I'm kind of thinking of going to the film industry or maybe even the writing industry. We'll see how that goes too. <laughs> That is fantastic. We've got another another film student here. I talked to one two weeks ago who uh, wants to direct, and she she was great. She she was in Tunisia, I think. You, uh, oh, if she's here, you guys should hook up because that's really interesting. That's because it's about ideas yeah. and sharing ideas and, and, mm -hmm. and building a party, building a group of people who are quite like minded. So that when you when you come out into the big wide world, you know like three or four people who are willing to do things for free for you because <laughs> you're going to need all the help you can get. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I think that's a good idea. It is, and you've got to build up those guys and, that, and you all swap roles, you know, you do the writing one day and they do the lighting and someone does the camera and then you, do, and you all act in each other's stuff and you keep swapping up so that you can keep, roll, keep the machine rolling. But I think it's a wonderful idea, particularly filmmaking, writing and that sort of stuff. Mainly because it's, there's such a hunger for it. You can now yeah. make pretty much, you know, zero and stick it up on, online and everybody's going to, you can get people to come and watch. It. Have you made a movie yet? Have you, have you written something? Um, well, I had a writing project. So basically I had to give it like an outline of a film. But yeah, yeah I can't do that in the last minute. So I'm not very proud of that. <laughs> yeah, that's, it's hard. That's really yeah. hard. Have you got a favorite writer, drama writer? Because that tends to give you some good ideas. Because my um, favorite, one of my favorite writers is mm -hmm. is your very own Avril Hugo. Oh yeah, yeah. We had to study one of his plays. Okay, my favorite writer at the moment is probably J.M. Kutsia. Um, he wrote this novel called uh, "Waiting for the Barbarians." I read it a few weeks ago for my course and actually enjoyed it. It's a wow. very good book. Uh, well, I would recommend if you want to read a Fugard one, a called "Statements After an Arrest Under the Immorality Act." Pretty long title, but it's the only one with a really, really long title. And it's really brilliant. I did it when I was 18, I think, at university, college. But it, it had a profound effect on me. What's quite challenging about it as an actor is that the point of the play is the police bust this multiracial couple. Mm -hmm. The woman is white, the guy is coloured. That's specific in South Africa, historically. He's my colour and not uh, darker. So that catches in the net. Indians and, and people, and the Asian Indians and all those people, they're in bed together and the police bust them because you're not allowed to sleep with a person who's not mm -hmm. white. And then the, basically the court moves into their bedroom, the judge, and they hold the, the trial in their bedroom while they're in bed naked. And oh. it's really, really powerful. It's a really good play. Statements after an arrest under the Immorality Act. And it speaks to, to today as well, because we've got similar problems happening today. Not so much in South Africa. Things, but it's not as bad as it was, thank God. I was alive mm -hmm. during apartheid. Um, but I highly recommend it because reading as much as you can will give you really good ideas about your visual, will build your visual life. And give you a sense of the kind of things you want to talk about. And you may already know, but it's most people who want to make films 
don't have a clue what they want to talk about. So yeah. of course they find a voice and they're like fumbling around, but it starts with a seed that you will find through books and, and various media, poetry, art, whatever you, excites you. Uh, you know, that's, mm -hmm. So that, that would be my recommendation. And keep playing left back because it's one of the hardest roles. No one wants <laughs> yeah. to be left back. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I didn't want to be left back. I got put there. <laughs> In the middle of the season. <laughs> do, you play, do you play right back too? It's really good to be able to play both. Yeah, yeah, I have played uh, both before. Because when you're on the on the bench, that it, that just solves <laughs> someone who can play both sides on the bench. Yeah. <laughs> it's so so refreshing and nice to meet you. You too. <laughs> Thank you, and good luck with everything. Good luck with the soccer. Thank good luck you. With getting back to a, the idea of having a game of soccer. Inshallah, as they say. I think she wins for being our, the furthest away from us geographically today. She does. She does. Cape Town. Beautiful part of the world. Anyone wants to go to a beautiful city in South Africa, Cape Town is, is pretty spectacular on the sea.